the International Conference on International Law and Economics with the topic Reflections on Contemporary China. My name is Melissa Cambuí and I'm honored to moderate this first activity that will open the works of this great conference that undoubtedly is one of the largest events on China and international economics and politics that have ever has ever been organized. In case you haven't registered yet, don't waste any time. You are able to register until next Friday 14th so you can register to follow our panels and the four work groups that will happen from 14 to 18 July. Just a reminder, this and other panels will count on simultaneous translation so we can assure accessibility for our reflections and debates. I have a major in law, specialized in law and development from the Presbyterian University Mackenzie, which is hosting this conference and also realizing this first edition. Also, I'm a master in political law from the same institution and a doctorate in the International Affair Program of the Rio de Janeiro University. My agenda of research is focused on the national development of China. So it's an honor and a pleasure to be here moderating this first activity, which is gathering great experts to talk about such an important topic that is to understand the development process of China. And uh, undoubtedly, we could not start any better than receiving Dr. Robert Lawrence Kuhn, who is a corporate international strategist, an investment banker and well-known expert in China who is consulting international companies and doing businesses with this country. He was one of the 10 foreigners awarded with the Friendship Medal from the Chinese reform by President Jinping in the anniversary of the reform in December 2018. For 30 years, Dr. Kun have worked with uh, Chinese leadership and the government. He's a commentator for CNN, BBC, CCTV, CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox, both, and also a columnist for So China Morning. He's an investor with the Kung Global Capital. He's an author of 30 different books, including how Chinese leaders think, that talks about the President Jinping and also The Man Who Changed the China, that is the biography on Jiang Zemin. And the a bestseller in China in for 2005. He's a presenter and co-producer of Closer to China, a program of CGTM on poli politics, society and international affairs of China. He's also a president for Kuhn Foundation and uh, he's a presenter and uh, a host of Closer to Truth, a TV series of PBS that is the program talking about science and philosophy. And today, Dr. Robert Lawrence Kuhn will be interviewed by Elise Jabun, Evandro Menezes de Carvalho, Karim Costa Vasquez, Luisa Duarte, and Olivia Bloom. Nothing would have been possible without the 
dozens of people who were involved in this project. So I would like to thank the post-graduation program of uh, Mackenzie University, represented by Professor Siqueira Neto and all other professors and researchers who were involved in developing this event, where she the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Jindal University, the Rural University of Rio, Federal of Viçosa, a FESPSP, University, uh, Fe Federal University of ABC, Universidade de la Plata, and also the University of Rio de Janeiro, who are composing our organiza organization committee. And also, we'd like to thank Brings Policy Center of Puki Rio Institute Asia, Radar China, and Autonomia Literaria that at this point are broadcasting this to more than 10 channels of Facebook and YouTube so we can assure to reach a great audience. Also, we would like to thank very much the interpreters who are with us today. Karine Souto is a conference interpreter, translator, and she's in love for education. That's why she dedicates a great part of her time to share her knowledge. She has a major in translation and interpretation um, by Universidade de Nova de Julho, and she's certified in courses on interpretation by Alumni and UNB. Karini is a founder of Glossa Soluções e Idiomas, which is also one of our partners. We deeply thank her for collaborating with our event. Also, Fernanda Vitarelli, another interpreter, who is a translator and interpreter from Alumni, and she's also uh, graduated in law by PUC Minas. She has already in interpreted law characters as Ellen Grace, uh, the Supreme Court Minister, Bruce Hoffman, a uh, constitutional professor of Yale University and David Carroll. And uh, she has been teaching English for 11 years. She has a post-graduation course in um, teaching English. So thank you very much, Karini and Fernanda. Now, talking about how our session, how it's going to be. It, at first, Dr. Robert Lawrence Kuhn will talk about the scenario, politics and economics scenario of China, and then we're going to have the interview made by our journalists. At the end, I will select uh, some of the questions sent by the audience, so Dr. Robert may can answer them, and then we're going to have any final words. So please send your questions to the Q&A here of Zoom. Robert Lawrence Kuhn have been, has been helping for decades so the world can understand China and China can understand the world. Today is a great honor and uh, we feel very happy to receive you, Robert. We're deeply thankful to have you here. So without any further ado, you have the word now. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to participate in the first international conference on law and international political economy, Reflections on Contemporary China. I can think of no country on earth, perhaps no country in history, where the phrase political economy is more apt 
In fact, when I advise multinational corporations doing business in China, which I have for about 10 years, uh, I use what I call a politico-strategic framework, which can only work in China. And I'll talk more about that uh, later. I want to thank the organizers, uh, McKinsey University, uh, my new good friend, Melissa, and all the panelists, including my old friend, uh, Evandro. Uh, I look forward to your questions. And uh, as I said, no questions are out of bounds. So, you know, lay it on, lay it on tough. I mean, the, I, I'm a great believer in being very honest uh, with a smile, uh, but, uh, you know, tough questions are good. So what, what I want to do uh, prior to the questions, which is the main part of our engagement, is to first outline some categories and issues that characterize China today. And you know, different people could pick different uh, approaches and different uh, categories, and it's not going to be comprehensive, but it does reflect my sense of how to understand China because the root of everything in China is politics. Now that's true in every country to some degree, but it's, it is not anywhere near as true as it is in China. And if I can convey that concept and to show you what it means, not just in the, in the kind of the public uh, big ideas of politics, but, but how business is done, and how foreign corporations can do business in China, how Chinese corporations do business. It is totally based on the political structure of, of how the system works. And that's the major message I want to, uh, to bring to you. So let's start. The first uh, pr principle that I want to convey is that there is a, a framework to understand what's happening in China. And the biggest idea in that framework, the biggest part of that framework is something that won't occur uh, for about a year and a half. And that's the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, the CPC, which will be coming late next year, 2022, probably late October, but dates are not set until the last minute. Um, as you may know, National Congresses of the Communist Party of China are held every five years. And they are scripted and they're very precise. And it looks like there's no uh, kind of no disputes. Everything is just presented. But behind the scenes, there are enormous numbers of, of struggles. Um, and that struggle determines leadership and leadership determines policies. So everything is always, is always, in the context of the next party Congress, because that sets leadership. Because of the hierarchical nature of the system, uh, because of the authoritative nature of the system, uh, without any competing parties in China, without a free media, uh, the leadership of the party is the critical factor that determines everything else. So all of the, the energy and focus is on those kinds of Congresses. Now, this next Congress is particularly important because what it will do will be to set in cement to make virtually permanent President Xi Jinping's overarching leadership really for the rest of his sentient life, irrespective of what position he holds, which is a separate issue. And that's what I want to explain in this uh, first point. Um, so he will almost certainly, I would say certainly, uh, be elected to an unprecedented third term as uh, general secretary of the party. And then the following March as president of the country and um, chairman of the, of the Central Military Commission. Those are the three major titles in China. And uh, almost equally important, his protégés will be elevated to the standing committee of the Politburo. Now just to understand how the system works, uh, the party controls the country in every aspect, and even more so under President Xi, which we'll talk about. Um, and then the, uh, the party is run by the Central Committee, which has roughly you know, 200 or so permanent members, 150 or more alternate members, 350 altogether. That is the official, um, the official uh, uh, authoritative body 
But of that, there's the Politburo of the, of the Standing Committee, which has you know, 26, 27 members, different time. But of those Politburo members, the Standing Committee, which has been as few as five and as many as nine, it's now seven, uh, is absolutely in charge of the, of the country. So uh, to those seven people who are in the Standing Committee, everything in China reports. There's nothing in China that doesn't report to one of those seven. And that's the way the system works. Now, when term limits were eliminated for China's presidency in March of 2018, many of you may remember that who followed China, the world reacted with great concern that China was headed back to a, uh, uh, to a Maoist uh, kind of structure. That was not the case. Um, but what, what is fascinating to see is the way the world reacted to that announcement about the presidency. And I'm gonna exaggerate this a little bit to make the point, but this reaction by the world when the, the term limit of the president was, was eliminated uh, demonstrates how little, how little the world understands how China really works. And this is what I really want you to understand when, because you probably remember when term limits were eliminated and how everybody was upset. And I wanna show you why that event was a total misunderstanding of how China works. Because China's presidency has no power, no official power. It has prestige, of course, it has international um, uh, relations and it's a very um, honorary title, but there's zero power. There's nothing reports to the president uh, directly. Uh, the power in China is as general secretary of the Communist Party of China, which runs the country, and separately, the chairman of the Central Military Commission in Mao's famous uh, words, uh, you know, the, the, the gun controls the country. Um, and neither the general secretary of the CPC, the party, or the chairman of the Central M Military Commission ever had term limits. So they never had term limits, but the presidency did, and the presidency has no power. So in that sense, it didn't matter. But here's what does matter. Here's what does matter. The structure of the Standing Committee of the Politburo was designed to em embody collective leadership. And you've probably heard that term about China, collective leadership. And that means that there is a group of people who collectively run the country. So when, just to pick an example, when Hu Jintao was general secretary of the party, they had a nine member uh, a standing committee and Hu Jintao was first among equals of, in the standing committee, certainly, but it was among equals. And so as, as I've used the example, if, if Hu Jintao decided, you know, I wanna visit Brazil because uh, I think it's important relationship, so I'm gonna go. And if the standing committee, if five of the members of the standing committee said, you know, we don't think you should go to Brazil, uh, this year for X, Y, we think you should go to Germany. He can't go to Brazil. He has to go to Germany because this, the, the odd thing about China is that at the standing co committee level, China is an absolute democracy. And so, it, it, and it's an odd number. So the voting at the standing committee is a democracy. Whereas in every other country, the leadership has, uh, has executive powers, but then there's the balance of powers, of course, in other countries as well, plus elections. Uh, but in China, no, the collective leadership at the very top had this, uh, uh, um, this voting um, uh, structure. Now, it was never really used because there was always behind the scenes negotiating and, and, uh, and uh, discussions, and then they reached consensus. But the point is they, that forced the consensus to be done. Okay, now that's the background of the way it was collective leadership after the death of Mao Zedong, where under Deng Xiaoping, they instituted collective leadership so that they'd never again have a Mao Zedong, which who brought the, the country into great, um, great distress during the Cultural Revolution. It's another complicated subject. We don't have to go into that today, uh, but collective leadership was designed to uh, prevent that. So. As I said, the elimination of term limits in 2018 was not a major event in terms of China's real power. But what happened 
in late 2016, after a, a party plenum, really was significant, and nobody picked that up. Uh, I was actually asked to write a, a, an, an article uh, about that um, by leadership in China. They didn't tell me what to say, they never do. Uh, but I, I wrote that in, in the South China Morning Post to explain what happened. But it, it didn't get the, the attention that it really deserved. And what happened in 2016 is that uh, Xi Jinping was made core, C-O-R-E in English, Hushin in Chinese, of the party. Now that was a significant, that was the significant event. Because when you're core of the party, that means that if all the other people in the, polit in, in the Standing Committee of the Politburo vote one way and you vote the other way, you're the boss. So it's a huge change uh, to be made Hushin or core of the party because that put the one person on a totally different plane than the other members of the Standing Committee. And just to be clear, uh, uh, it, it was a retrospective term. It was first used with Jiang Zemin, although retrospectively, Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping were core at, during their periods of time. <clears throat> but notably, Hu, Hu Jintao never got that designation of core. So he never was in that position. So when Xi Jinping got that, it was a dramatic change. And it meant that he was uh, basically that the other members of the standing reported to him um, in a new structure. Then the next event was, uh, and almost as significant, was in October 2017 at the 19th uh, National Congress of the Communist Party, in which Xi Jinping's name was written into the party constitution as a, uh, in a, a complicated phrase, which sounds kind of awkward in English, it sounds better in Chinese, but it's still a big phrase. You may have heard it. It's called Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Uh, and uh, we can actually parse each of those words to understand what they mean. But the overarching concept is that Xi Jinping now becomes the arbiter in the constitution of what socialism and Marxism means in China. Now, understand what that means. As we said, the country is run by the party. Nothing, nothing in the country happens without the party's leadership. The party is founded on Marxism and socialism and communism, which are changing concepts, as, as we all know. And now Xi Jinping is the ultimate arbiter of what that means, the ultimate arbiter of Marxism, of socialism, of communism. And so he singularly is the one who decides that. So not only is he core of the party and above all the others and everybody else reports to him, but now he's the ultimate and singular arbiter of, of Marxism on which the party is based. So Xi Jinping determines what is Marxism or socialism. Socialism is the governing philosophy of the party and the party runs the country. You don't have to see, you know, you don't have to take symbolic logic to see the structure there, that the case is closed, that Xi Jinping is the leader of the country and will be for the rest of his sentient life. Even if he chooses at some point not to have the position of general secretary, even if he does at some point, whoever has that effectively will still be reporting to him uh, because he's the ultimate arbiter of what the, of what the policy of the country is. So that was a, a long uh, explanation of, of, of the, the first point, and I'm going to go quickly through the rest, but that is fundamentally uh, uh, needed to understand the structure of China. So a second point is the overarching leadership of the CPC over all aspects of Chinese society. We know the 100th anniversary of the CPC is coming up on July 1st, a major event. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the, the CPC's legitimacy is, is, is now really tied to two very large goals. Um, and th this is important to understand how the party operates. It, it no longer claims its legitimacy on pure ideology, 
that of course was a disaster, but really on a utilitarian achievement of, of these two big goals. The first is to elevate the standards of living of the Chinese people. And the second is to restore China, the restore, use that word deliberately, to its status at the center stage of the world. Uh, taken together, this is what uh, Xi Jinping has called the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation or the Chinese dream. So those two big ideas. Now we go into some specifications in my third point, which are the grand visions that uh, China has going forward with the years 2035 and 2050. Those are the two target dates. We should go back to the original way this was founded. It was originally founded on what they call two centenary goals, 2020 and 2050. The first 2020 was designed to represent the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party, which is this year, but 2020 was the sort of the rounded off year in which that would occur. And that was to achieve what they call in English, a moderately prosperous society, which sounds an odd phrase, uh, but um, it is uh, in, in Chinese, it, it, it's, it, 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 it has a lot of uh, meaning and, and um, it, sounds, it sounds very good. Now the object of that, so just to rehearse, was to double the GDP of, of 2010 in 2020 and double the uh, income per capita. Uh, so that's the more important one is the income per capita uh, in 2020. Uh, and that was the longstanding quantitative definition of that goal. Xi Jinping added another aspect to it, which is really important and has become a very strong uh, 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 a, a driver of, of, of China's accomplishment. And that is, he said, basically, even if we achieve that quantitative goal, even if we double the GDP of 2010 and 2020 and income per capita, if any Chinese citizen remains in abject or extreme poverty, we cannot call ourselves a moderately prosperous society. So we have to eliminate all extreme poverty in China in order to achieve that goal. Now, um, this is a whole other conversation uh, about uh, poverty in China and how the program worked. Uh, about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I was asked by leadership to start studying poverty alleviation in China. And I can tell you that, was, that would not have been my first choice. Uh, I like studying brain science in China and radio astronomy and Chinese politics, um, going out into the fields in you know, fourth class hotels and spending weeks in, in, in the poorest area of China would not be my idea of a good time. Uh, but I agreed that, look, leadership says it's important it is. And it was one of the best decisions of my life. Really, it wasn't my decision. I was asked to do it, but I agreed. Uh, I learned so much and really saw a very different kind of China and appreciated what's happening. We can talk about poverty alleviation at, at another time, but um, that achievement in, in what is a little bit artificial in terms of setting goals and how it was working, but the accomplishment is real and it is really truly remarkable. Uh, and so that was the 2020 that was, that was achieved. Uh, the, the second goal, historically targeted 2050, when China intends to be what they call a fully modernized socialist country. And they use uh, six adjectives to describe it. Prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful. Those are the six adjectives. And, and they're all aspirational in, in the recognition that they, they're not there now, but they want to be then. And each of these terms need to be parsed and understood what it means. Prosperous means broadly um, the economic uh, level of the country. Everybody is, 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 is reasonably well off. They've now called that ter term common prosperity. Strong is, is uh, China's uh, position in the world geopolitically and militarily. Democratic is, a, is not the way um, the, uh, the Western system would look at democratic in terms of aspiration to, to elections but rather uh, a broad engagement of people in the overall process of governance. And we can just, just discuss at some point, maybe in the questions of, of how China intends and, and its structure and how it, de how it intends to be more and more democratic in the Chinese sense, which is not moving towards the Western system at all, 
but engaging more people in the process of governance. Culturally advanced, harmonious with different ethnic groups and beautiful obviously deals with the pollution and some and terrible pollution that China had. So uh, fourth point is that the economic vision that uh, Xi Jinping put forth um, in 2015, which has been somewhat updated, but, but the core has been kept, is what was then called five major development concepts, which is now called new development concepts. And they are innovation, coordination, green, open, and sharing. And uh, uh, what, what is, is critical there is innovation comes first. It's the first time in Chinese history that innovation, science and technology, but innovation broadly became the first thing. Coordination is absolutely unique in China where they will have uh, vast areas of the country that will have coordinated um, economic uh, policies. And we, we started with um, in uh, well, the three big areas in the North, what they call Jin Jin Ji, which is Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei province is the North. And then the Yangtze River economic belt, which is centered on Shanghai, which has eight or nine provinces behind it uh, along the Yangtze River. And then, um, and then in the South, uh, what they now call the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. And so these are the three, you know, dragon heads, as they may say in China, of coordinated development. Um, and then each of the others uh, are, are kind of obvious, we can describe it. In addition to that, uh, China has now moved to what they call a dual circulation economy, which is a very strange phrase that is not, it's not really an accurate description of what, what it means. And what it means is more reliance on the domestic economy shifting the economy away from an export uh, generated economy to a consumption uh, domestic economy that they have more control over. That makes you know, a lot of sense, uh, not just because of sanctions from the US, but, but in general, how China was going in its relationship with other countries, because it couldn't rely on, a, on an imbalance of trade in, into perpetuity. Fifth point is enhancing public ownership and diverse ownership at the same time, but frankly, more government controlled sectors um, uh, has been increasing over the last several years pretty dramatically. Um, although there are various reforms um, that are in, in, uh, instantiated for productivity and efficiency. Uh, and then recently, as you've seen, the private sector has been reined in a bit. Um, China has this phrase, uh, you know, kill kill the chicken to scare the monkey. But you know, this time some monkeys were uh, kind of uh, affected as well um, in terms to be sure that the private sector does not become any kind of rival politically to the, uh, to the party. Uh, but China is committed to, to uh, diverse ownership and, and private ownership, but just as long as it, it, knows its, uh, it knows its place in the political system. Six is a, an extraordinary emphasis on science and technology. Uh, China wants to become an what they call an innovative nation by 2025, a world center of science and technology by 2035, and a world power in science and technology by 2050. Uh, these are major terms, uh, major ideas that have been uh, emphasized very strongly. Uh, I've followed science and technology in China very closely. It, it was how I was my first visit to China in 1989, I was invited by the Science and Technology Commission. So that's the area that I mo have been most familiar with. And as you know, China wants to dominate, uh, at least not be secondary and, and desirably dominate key industries of the future. Artificial intelligence, AI, uh, um, electric vehicles, uh, quantum computing, new materials, biotech, brain science, space exploration and sea ocean research. Uh, th those are just some of the major categories in which China um, seeks to, to, uh, uh, to be a, that you know, innovative world center and then ultimately a world power. Uh, they don't say the world power um, because you don't have in Chinese uh and the, the difference between a, a, pow a power and the power. You don't have that in Chinese, but the implication is the power at some point in the future. Uh, seventh point is um, a commitment to rule of law. And this is underplayed in the Western media for sure that Xi Jinping has put into the fact that I, I think this is one of his most important reforms with respect. And what it means is 
the outcome is with respect to the vast majority of legal cases, it, there is effective judicial independence. It is not for all cases. The party can still intervene. That's why they call it actually a socialist rule of law or a rule of law with Chinese characteristics. And the party can intervene if it, 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 if it thinks that equity is not being um, uh, achieved by the rule of law for some reason, maybe the rule of law is, is insufficient at that point, or frankly, political reasons. So the party, they say in China that the, the, the party and the, and the law are equal. The party has to obey the law, the law has to, so there's no difference, but in truth, there is a difference and the party is above the law. But for the vast majority of the people, this has been a dramatic and very positive reform because what the key part of it was, was it moved the court system, the judges and the whole process, away from reporting to the local government, whether it was the city or the county, um, and it put it under the provincial government. And what that did was in the past, the court system were under the control of the party secretary and the party committee at the county level or the township level or at the city level. And so they would, could, and, and they paid the judges salaries and they, you know, they were totally under their control. And so at any moment, if the party secretary's you know, cousin had an automobile accident, it, you know, it was thrown out of court. Uh, and there was enormous numbers of abuses uh, by local party officials uh, in the court system. And this made the common people very angry and, and really just did not like the party. And Xi Jinping changed that uh, by changing the, jur the, the reporting system of the courts to above the local level so there was no interference. In addition to that, they put in very strict um, guidelines for judges such that there was no statute of limitations uh, in um, if they can show uh, um, bribery or any type of, uh, of untoward activity. So a judge could be 10 years re retired. And if, and if, if some case, if, if somebody proves that he did something 15 years ago that was illegal, uh, he could be prosecuted. So it, it made everyone very, very sensitive uh, to proper administration. And there are very strict rules in place that if there's any communication between political officials and court officials, it has to be reported. If it's not reported, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a crime. In addition, the Supreme People's Court system was expanded uh, and its jurisdiction expanded. So above the normal court system and then specialized courts were introduced such as an intellectual property. It's not the same level it is in, in developed countries yet, but China is very serious about intellectual property protection. Uh, if only because of Chinese companies uh, that are now innovating need to have that protection. Uh, next point is that, and again, this is to state the obvious, that uh, China will brook no compromise on issues that it considers sacrosanct, especially those dealing with matters of sovereignty and security, uh, which are very closely related to pride and dignity. And this includes Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Tibet, South China Sea, and especially Taiwan. All of these are you know, subjects for a complete discussion that we could have. And it's not the focus of this, of this conference, but certainly we can, we can address it. Next point is that China does continue to want to engage with the world proactively. Um, you're familiar with the initiatives, the Belt and Road Initiative. I was involved in the very first conferences on that. So I've followed that for, uh, you know, six, uh, six, seven years now. Um, uh, it's actually eight, eight years coming up. Um, uh, BRICS is, is a major uh, uh, interest of China. You're, you're very familiar with that. We can discuss that too. Another China with Central and Eastern Europe called the 17 plus one, 17 Central and Eastern Europe countries plus one is China. Uh, so China is looking to outreach and all. Certainly Africa is a major focus of attention. And uh, what we were talking about before the session began is that China is beginning to recognize that it can't just do economically efficient things, which is you know, extracting resources from these countries and sending in manufactured products, which effectively would create a, a neo-colonialist um, position for China, inadvertently on China's part, it's just doing what it's doing for its own benefit, but then creating resentment in countries legitimately. So China's getting to be sensitive to that. For example, in Africa, they're helping to set up with Ethiopia 
uh, special economic zones where cheap manufacturing of products, which is how China uh, um, enabled its reform to occur initially can occur in some other countries as well. And China is beginning to work with countries along those lines, which is very good. Uh, we can talk about the implications for Brazil in that, uh, in that way as well. Uh, next point, which is my tenth, is that China-U.S. competition uh, will be the defining geopolitical drama of the next several decades. Uh, again, to discuss that in great, uh, great depth. And then finally, uh, you know, I can't let go unsaid that the, the, uh, the public discourse in China, even private discourse, has been fairly dramatically tightened uh, under Xi Jinping's leadership. So the amount of kind of discussions that are different than current policies in China are pretty severely restricted. Uh, this has some benefits, if you will, in terms of, uh, of not distracting people from doing their business work. And it also has some severe liabilities, which, um, which you would know and we can, uh, we can discuss. So it, it, within China, in terms of the media, in terms of any discourse, social media, anything having to do with China's, the CPC's or Xi Jinping's core interests, are you know, very much restricted. So a critical question for China is that can China achieve what it wants to, for example, in innovation in, in, in a society that continues to uh, put strong restrictions on information? Uh, so this is a, uh, an ongoing question and I think th there's complex answers to it. So I want to conclude by giving a few words of why, which I said at the beginning, of why I, when I advise major companies uh, working in China, um, American, uh, European countries, in fact, it's Middle East countries, uh, Middle East companies, um, why I, I use what I call a politico-strategic framework for working. What does that mean? Uh, because it, it really, it, when you understand what it means uh, for multilateral corporations working in China, it is a deep insight that uh, enables you to understand how all China works. And the key to this, the key, is the organization department of the Communist Party. Now, you may or may not have heard of the organization. It's an internal department by its nature. It's like the personnel department of a corporation. A personnel department handles you know, appointments and training and whatever else. And in most, in all, uh, uh, corporations in, in the developed world, certainly, um, the personnel department is not very, I mean, it's important, but it's not a major department. And, and, and almost never will the head of the personnel department become a, a, a major corporate uh, executive in the country. It's sort of an adjunct uh, feature. And that's exactly the opposite in China. The organizational department of the party is the, one of the strongest uh, uh, resource that the party has because every high level official in China at the central government for sure, and also in the local government. So that means every governor, every vice governor, every um, uh, even director general levels, uh, and, in, and in towns, the mayor, the vice mayors, are all appointed by the organization department of the party. And every head and every senior executive of the state-owned enterprises, the SOEs, are also appointed by the party's organization department. And so every ambitious person in China, whether they're going into government at whatever level or uh, the business world, corporate, we'll talk about the private sector separately, but you know, the, the uh, public sector, the government sector is now much more important. So every single leader uh, is at the, at the uh, large S of the organization department of the party. And it, 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 it does the appointing, it does the training, it does the monitoring, it does the disciplining, and if necessary, does the firing, uh, all in the organization department of the party, the whole country. So, what I, so here's the key, key question then, given that, which is quite remarkable by itself, and indeed one of the benefits uh, of, of how, why China has been so successful is the training of personnel. Uh, you know, it's not, there are obviously cases of nepotism and payoffs to get positions, 
But by and large, that, that is much less so. And under Xi Jinping, it's dramatically less so because of the anti-corruption campaign. Uh, and so the, 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 the organization department is a very sophisticated scientific way of, of training uh, generations and new generations and current leadership. And therefore the, the managerial class in China, both in the public sector and in the, in the business sector of government are very sophisticated and not, not only naturally smart and experienced, but highly trained. And so it's a very successful system. And indeed, part of the reason for China's success is this organizational structure uh, of the organizational department structure, organization department structure. Um, now, what is the criteria by which they, they judge how people are to be promoted? And it is always the resident political philosophy set by the senior leader, now Xi Jinping. And so to the degree that you know the philosophy of Xi Jinping, for example, those five, uh, um, uh, those five um, con con major concepts of development, you know, innovation, coordination, green, open, and sharing, uh, that has been and is the, a, a driving philosophy. And so if you know that, and you know, and you know that the, the officials and the, and the corporate heads are going to be judged by that criteria, you can then uh, structure your business to conform to that, not changing what you do. Uh, so for example, one company that I've uh, worked with, one of the largest uh, in the world in its field, we did a, a, pre a presentation that showed how they were contributing to each of these categories. And that gave great benefit to the, <clears throat> the executives of state-owned enterprises <clears throat> who then could show on their resumes that they were they were um, consistent with uh, national policy. Um, th this way of thinking, I assure you, does not work anywhere else in the world, but in China. I mean, may, something like this may work in some uh, developing countries that are uh, kind of dictatorships, but those are not economically interesting anyway. China's absolutely unique in being a, a country of great development, yet working on this system. And part of the reason it works is on this, the, the way of thinking in the organization department. And under Xi Jinping, it's been made much more effective because corruption has been severely um, uh, uh, reduced, not eliminated totally, but very severely reduced. <clears throat> and the organization department is able to bring this <clears throat> scientific way of thinking uh, in terms of the training, the selecting training, monitoring, and um, uh, management of uh, of of the uh, uh, of the administrative leaders of the country, um, and so that core element drives uh, China's development, and it also drives the business sector. And very important for foreign companies who are doing business in China uh, to uh, to understand. So, in the future, if there are you know good Brazilian companies that want to do business in China, we have the we have the way to help them. So that's my overview, and now I'm, um, I'm, I'm ready for action with the questions. Excellent, Dr. Robert. Very enlightening. For sure we'll have a great debate and let's get started with Elias Jabour, who is a professor of the post-graduation programs in politics sciences of international Rela affairs for uh, the University of Rio de Janeiro with 25 years studying to understand the Chinese development and he's an author of four, lit of four books and uh, he wrote several different articles in Brazil and abroad. He will uh, have two books this year, two new books, one called uh, China and uh, Our Time and another book that's called Socialist, Socialist development in 21st century challenges after Bolshevik revolution by Rotrit. Elias, 
The floor is yours. You have five minutes to ask your questions and Dr. Robert has 10 minutes to answer to your questions. The floor is yours, Elias. I would like to thank the opportunity of being here with such accomplished people to interview maybe one of the most um, accomplished person, if not the greatest expert in China, that is Robert Lawrence. I'd like to tell you that three days ago I was speaking in a conference here in Brazil and I compared your role with in relation to U the US and, uh, and I'd like to tell you that three days ago I was speaking in a conference here in Brazil and I compared your role in the relationship between the US and China with the role that Ahmed Hamid had in the relationship with the Soviet Union and the US. I don't know if you remember, you are aware of the fact of Ahmed during the Cold War and what he did. He was the first beneficiary of the concessions that an app had in the Soviet Union and he became a fundamental character a long time between the relationship re regarding the relationship of uh, the US and the Soviet Union and I think you have a crucial role you play a key role along the history and the years since 19 89. I believe my question is very historical, theoretical, and you told us we could ask difficult questions, so I think humanity leaves out of disruptive moments. For instance, the Industrial Revolution took us to the arise of an explanatory and theoretical body of a new reality that comes with the industrialization process. For instance, the politics economics of Jaden Smith, Marxist, Marxism better, they are explanatory bodies that arise to explain the new reality that came with the Industrial Revolution. The Russian Revolution created constitutional uh, a constitutional scenario to have a, a large scale planning for economics. And with that, there are some theories that arise based on this new reality. It can be seen as a theory that corresponds to a time and the possibility of the domain of human with the regulated capitalism. Nowadays, I believe we are living a new disruptive moment in humanity in this moment. I believe it has to do with the arise of uh, technological innovations that are disruptive as well. In the core of the great large Chinese state companies like 5G, big data, the artificial intelligence, and also the possibilities that these new platforms will deliver, and deliver actually, to China uh, rising the capacity of planning the situation on, in their territory and from a, a certain point of view this generate new regularities in economic 
and also make us get to a situation where China, when they foster the possibility of planning their economy with a, a state intervention that is much more present than 40 years ago, they create a demand for the social scientists around the world to understand what are the new regularities that arise in that economy. It's impossible for a country to grow for 40 years uh, continuously and keeping the same regularity theories. So my question is like very straightforward. And well, before asking, I believe nowadays we're leaving disruptive moment from these changes that are happening in China, within China. And somehow there is a crisis of the Western thinking. We're living a crisis, like an existential crisis that impedes Western to really observe China in this way, I'm telling you, from a disruptive thinking, a more sophisticated intellectual aspect. First, do you agree with this thought of the, that the Western is impeded to think of China as a more sophisticated intellectual term. And the second question is, is it possible to say that there is a need of a new conceptual and theoretical body that the Chinese economic development will demand a new conceptual body to understand that country. I believe myself that the Chinese process cancels the previous theories. It overcomes the explanatory capacity of the classical theories of economic development. Today there is a huge need of finding a theory based on the new reality of China and I would love to hear your opinion on that. I would like to thank very much to have the opportunity of asking such easy questions and uh, to answer and to hear your answer to the audience. Robert, you have the word, you have up to 10 minutes to talk about all this. That's a huge challenge, yeah? Okay, very good. Well, uh, a proper answer to Elias's very important uh, and thoughtful um, uh, vision uh, would take uh, not 10 minutes, but a, a, a full university course, I think. Would we, maybe he and I could teach keep a course together on, on this. It would take that long to properly answer the question. But let, let me, let me uh, give you some uh, thoughts on it. Uh, I totally agree that we are at a moment of inflection and a, a change as a mathematical curve will inflect and change its shape. <clears throat> That's where we are in, um, in, in global um, uh, political economy at the time. Um, generated um, primarily by changing technologies with uh, big data and uh, access to, to information. Um, there, there are a lot of strands in, in the thinking, um, and, and I can only uh, give you a reaction to some of them, not necessarily in a, in a logical order. Um, the first is if we do agree that there is this inflection point in, uh, in in advanced uh, political economy. Uh, I would argue that therefore the old terms that we use to describe political systems such as capitalism, socialism, communism are, um, are not only um, archaic, 
but dis but uh, distort but they distort the reality. Uh, I've said that the these terms and 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 in this I'm probably antagonizing people all over in the U capital system, social system, socialist system. Everybody likes to use those terms, but I do not because I think they distort. If you look at the way socialism is used in today's world, uh, it, it, it's all over the place. Um, and there's no coherent definition of it um, at all. Uh, you see in the US, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders and progressive Democrats call themselves socialists. Um, you have people who are socialists severely criticizing China as not being true socialists because uh, they have a market system. <clears throat> so you see the term uh, it's totally, uh, <clears throat> totally distorted. Uh, I once wrote an article that my, uh, if I had to pick a term, I would pick a term called optimizationism. I'm not sure how you translate that, but the idea of making uh, the concept of optimization, not maximization, optimization uh, into a political philosophy. Of course, nobody would follow something called optimizationism because it doesn't sound very exciting. Uh, but that's what all countries are doing, taking the circumstances all intelligent uh, countries are doing, and China certainly doing that. Uh, but it is not doing it in some very organized um, uh, plan, multi-decade plan that they, they see what's happening. They do have their multi-decade plans, but it is constantly monitored and changed. I liken it to flying a helicopter. So if you see a helicopter, it's staying in one place, right? And it, it's stationary. And it looks like you don't have to do anything, just staying there. But that's exactly the opposite. To keep a helicopter in, in, in one place you have to constantly change all different parameters because the slightest thing can throw it off. So it is very difficult to fly a helicopter in one place and you have to be highly professional to do it. And I use that as analogy with the, with the Chinese economy. It is a continuous checking of all different things where things go wrong back and forth. And so um, financial risk, for example, for the last three years has been right at the top of the list and continues to be uh, in China because of excess of debt at the corporate level, at the local level. It's a major problem and continues to be in China. It, it is controllable, but it's only controllable like flying a helicopter. You have to constantly, uh, constantly check what's happening. I've heard it said in China <clears throat> that the advent, and, and, and Elias is, is uh, representing this, and I think is legitimate, that the uh, access of big data and uh, can, can, can give a planning system what it never had before and indeed make that a kind of optimization system. There's one Chinese company I, I was working with uh, that is the leading company that is, uh, that is designed to make uh, offline competitive with online. Now, as we know, online, especially in China, has dominated everything and has come to be the dominant place in the country, the, the, the dominant uh, uh, way of, 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 uh, of consumption in the country. And so this company is now trying to give what they call offline, which is interesting. We used to call that the normal business, the retail stores, et cetera. They now have a specific title. They're calling it offline. Um, give offline the capacity to compete with online. And the way they do it, is to be extraordinarily data intensive. So they have robots that are, that kind of unobtrusively war, uh, uh, move around in shopping malls, uh, taking extraordinary detailed data of people's buying habits, th their facial recognition, now they claim to you know, protect the privacy, but they can therefore know your interests so that when you go into a store, that, that it, it will tell you, the store will tell you where you should shop or what, what things are on sale because they know your buying habits. And so it can be highly efficient. They can also uh, direct the, the, the traffic to make it everyone more efficient, offer different pricing at different times to, to, to optimize. And so we see the beginning of this, it. it's just starting, uh, but it is very effective. And so we, we are seeing a totally new, um, a economy where at the, sa at the same time, people have ultimate choices 
so you, you you can buy whatever you want, but yet there is a planning system that can optimize that in the process. And some people then would say that that gives legitimacy to the to the ultimate communist model, where you know everyone is equal and everybody is equally rich. Uh, the old communist model is that everyone was equal, but everyone was equally poor. Um, again, I choose not to do that. I choose to say it is a totally different way of thinking. And so I would agree strongly with Elias's view that we're at an inflection point, a, a point of transition, a paradigm shift in how uh, economies are run, uh, especially when you deal with, with, uh, with broad level consumption. Uh, but I would not agree to use the term socialism or communism or capitalism associated with that. I think that distorts it. I think we just have to see that it's a new system. And in this new system, uh, China is certainly a pioneer. And in some of it, it's, it's the pioneer, certainly with e-commerce and with uh, delivery services and everything else. <clears throat> when I first started doing business in China in the late 1990s, uh, China was not a country uh, uh, commercially. It was a bunch of hundreds of regions because if you had a company in one region you couldn't you couldn't sell products in other regions because there was no effective or cost effective transportation system in the 90s starting the late 90s and then accelerating china had the greatest infrastructure development in in, in world history with its road system and its high speed rail uh, airports etc so that now the whole country is a single market effectively or at least um, much of uh, much of the eastern uh, and, it, and, it, and 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 more and more inland as well, uh, so that the efficiency of reaching the whole country is now very very real, um, and this transformation has been uh, has been dramatic, and so as we look to the future and we see the use of of uh, big data, uh, you, you see certainly in the cons in, in the world of consumers and consumption. A, a dramatic transformation, which to me is worthy of a new name, not trying to sh shift and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, kind of modify the old names that people have, uh, ha have utilized. Uh, so, so that's one, way, one aspect in which I totally agree. And then there are other aspects, I mean, there uh, of the industrial economy, uh, which are complex because state-owned enterprises, uh, which have, um, have been uh, elevated in their importance under, under uh, President Xi's administration uh, have real issues. Their productivity is certainly lower than private enterprise. Every study has shown that return on assets. And so they're trying to figure out how do you keep that system, which is a system of ultimate control so that when you need to uh, have a national emergency, for example, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, or the, um, the COVID-19 epidemic um, pandemic in early in China, early in last year in 2020, uh, you can mobilize the SOE standard enterprises rapidly to achieve a, um, a national objective and not worry about um, the you know, shareholder interests or or um, board of directors, you just order them to do this on the spur of the moment. It's rare occasions, those being two that I can think of now uh, over, the, over more than a decade period. So they're rare, but they still show that state-owned enterprises uh, are not totally behold, uh, focused on shareholder interests, but uh, most of the time they are. Uh, just naturally, but when there's a national emergency, they can be utilized. And China likes that um, in terms of its political structure, being able to have that opportunity. Notwithstanding, though, there is recognition that the effectiveness of state-owned enterprises are lower. And therefore, how do you how do you modify that? And you know, some would say just eliminate them. And China, and certainly Xi Jinping says, no, that's not right. We need that is part of our system and in the Chinese way of thinking that also validates the, the socialism uh, of, of, of the country, which gives legitimacy to the, the party's original philosophy, which enables the party to continue. So there is this, um, there is this need to maintain that. 
<clears throat> of uh, the socialist system and the, and the state of enterprises gives that some kind of legitimacy. So then how do you, how do you bring, how do you elevate the efficiency? And they're talking about kind of multiple ownership. So they're allowing private enterprises to invest in state-owned enterprises and take more managerial control, uh, uh, cutting um, uh, off, um, uh, making managers more, um, more related to the, uh, to the performance of the company. I mean, there are various ways. Uh, you're not gonna get all the way, but in, from China's point of view, they will optimize this uh, control that they have of the, of the economy through state-owned enterprises and at the same time trying to make them efficient. And generally what's happening is that they're, they're di distinguishing it by, by industry, by oh, in in industrial sector, almost finished, <laughs> uh, industrial sector. So some industrial sectors, which are natural monopolies will always be state-owned enterprises. Some that are clearly market uh, oriented by themselves, uh, you can divest all, all the state-owned enterprises. And then those are in the middle, in the middle, uh, where it, it's hard to determine which state enterprises will compete on an equal basis with private enterprises, so that the private enterprises will make state-owned enterprises more efficient. So those are the three general categories of uh, of how China thinks uh, now. But you know, to conclude, uh, Elias's point is exceedingly important. This is a a, a transition point and an inflection point in terms of political economy in the world. And China is indeed one of the, leading the way in this new way of thinking. Robert, you and Elias, surely should make a course on this. Elias and uh, myself um, and other researchers were, were giving another name that is called uh, the economy of projecting. So I'm sure you should keep on going with this dialogue. Now, we're going to hear Evandro Menezes de Carvalho. He's a professor and coordinator of the study core of China in the FGV Rio de Janeiro, and he's a constitutional law professor of the University, Federal University Fluminense, also a consultant of Rano Advogados. He was a senior scholar of the Shanghai University for the Department of Economics, Economy and Finance, and he's also a member of Center of BRICS studies of uh, from the university, and he's a doctor in international law by from the University of São Paulo. Fernando, you have the word up to five minutes, please. And let's try to keep on time, please, because we are almost um, out of time. Just one correction. I am a professor of international law for Federal Fluminense. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Be a member of this panel with extraordinary people that I admire so much. I read your text, Luisa's, Olivia, Carla, Elias, and above all, having the chance to uh, talk with Professor Robert Lawrence, uh, and I was honored enough to to have the opportunity of being interviewed by him in a program on BRICS. I had a small participation, but I was so honored to have the chance to know him face to face. And now I'm here on the opposite side. Now I'm going to interview you. Robert, when we evaluate the Chinese governance model, from the Western perspective, it looks like the Chinese governance model was not good enough. Let's put this way. Some myths are still 
living as if the democracy and the rule of law of the Western side would be perfect, better than the governance model in China. And most of this perception has to do with prejudice and lack of knowledge. And also, there is a lot of diversity of democracies as there are diff the notions of rules of law in different countries. We cannot have all of them within the same boxes including the notion of socialism with the uh, Chinese characteristics. They, can, they comprise the political, economical and the historical characteristics that are a result of the a historical process that borrows some elements of the Soviet um, socialism and also the capitalism of the last decades and they make more like a, a well noticeable some characteristics of the Chinese model it's a governance that is very specific when we think about things that are in the constitution of China's socialist democracy, uh, economic model that is socialist also, and the law including, that are concepts that under uh, an orthodox capitalist uh, thinking would generate contradictions, but not uh, on, on the perspective, the Chinese perspective, according to them. And when we think about the socialist law system, and this democracy in, let's say, Chinese style, we see government taking different measures. You have already mentioned the commitment with uh, the rule of law. And one of the symbols, even more than a symbol, a concrete initiative in this direction had to do with the approval of uh, an, the new civil code. This is something very important. Also, on the perspective of uh, the democracy in China, also thinking about Chinese democracy, the recent decision during the 13th uh, Popular Assembly held last March that reveals the organic law on the Chinese legislative and their procedure rules with different initiatives in this sense. The legal procedures have a, a key role in decision making, also the state commission role highlighting the guarantees of their representatives. And, well, to ask my question, we see the use that is increasingly higher of uh, technological resources as big data and artificial intelligence. But at what extent these technological resources can increment even more the Chinese uh, democracy, allowing more of the popular participation and also the rule of law in China. Uh, this is my question. This is a topic I dedicate a lot of my time. I love to study that and I would love to hear your thoughts on this matter. Thank you very much once again. Pensamentos e opiniões. Muito obrigado mais uma vez. Thank you, Evandro. Again, it's great to see you again and it's nice to reverse roles. I was interviewing you, uh, now you're interviewing me. So that's the 
that's 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 the great uh, great aspect of uh, of today's world. So that's uh, that's that's good fun. Look, I think this is a really important topic. Um, I have focused on uh, rule of law in terms of the court system, which I described before. But what you're talking about is 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 the bigger sense of that, and and that focuses really on what China means by its word democratic. As I said, China has set democracy as one of its six major goals for its full achievement of uh, a fully of fully modernization. What does that mean? It certainly does not mean the Western sense of, of electing senior leaders by, by a popular vote or multi, a multi-party system. So if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? Again, it's a term that is used different by different people in different ways and therefore introduces more confusion. So it's important to understand what that means. And it, what it means in simple form is that it broadens the participation in the process of governance, which cannot be done by government alone uh, because of the co- super complexity of today's world. When, uh, you know, 50 years ago, when there were no, there was, you know, everybody had one pair of, a single pair of shoes, one style, one color, you know, you could try to plan that didn't work, of course, but you could think that you could. Now with uh, hundreds of thousands of different products and and different ways of thinking, it's impossible. So what it does is it tries to involve more more in the process of of governance. Um, And this, the best example, you've used the National People's Congress, the legislature, putting out these rules, etc. And that's, that's very important part of the process. The, uh, that used, you know, was traditionally in the West called a rubber stamp because the party decides and then they just uh, just implement it and give it the, the patina or the superficiality of, of law, but it was really decided behind closed door, doors in, in Zhongnanhai by the party. Uh, but in today's world, that's, that's just impossible because there are so many complexities that you really do have to have a codification of, of, of law. Uh, but what is to me, the, the best uh, exemplification of the Chinese concept of democracy is not the National People's Congress, but its, uh, its, uh, its younger or uh, 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 sibling, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is the CPPCC. And so every year in March, the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference meet, and each one has more than 3,000 members. And that's why they call that meeting Lianhui in Chinese, or the two sessions, because there are two separate bodies. The legislator is the, is the only official legal um, uh, uh, authority in China. It's the highest legal authority for the government. Everything reports to that. Uh, so what does the CPPC do? It has no legal authority. What it, what it is, is basically the word consultative. It is a, an advice giving uh, organ. Uh, and that seems absurd because nobody, you know, official, why do they care about somebody giving them advice? But, uh, and, and so it, it was originally designed to be inclusive of, of more than the party elements so that various sources of society could, could, bring, um, could bring ideas. And in the past, it really was a uh, a superficial kind of image and really had no substance. But developing over a a long number of years, uh, 10 years or more, and and, and intensifying as society got more complex, is that in that body, you really have some of the most sophisticated people in China in their fields. And one field I know uh, that I've, I've studied in that group is, is healthcare and medical. And so of the members, there might be 50 of those members of the CPPCC who are doctors, heads of hospitals, top researchers, et cetera. And these are some of the best people in the country. A couple are very close friends. Um, and they don't care about anything else but doing the best for their system. Um, and so they're not worried about being fired like an official would be fired. As one doctor told me, he said, you know, uh, they can fire me from my position in this organization or that organization, but they're not going to fire me for being a doctor because I saved their lives and their families' lives. So I, I'm never going to be fired from that. So I'm going to tell the truth. And they have enormous, not just moral power, but now social power. 
So when these doctors, using that one example, but it applies to all fields, these experts put a report together and send it to officials, the officials are now scared to, to, um, uh, to ignore it. And they must take it seriously because there's the pressure of social media and there's the pressure of these experts. And so expertise in China has become more and more important. China has always uh, given very high prestige to scientists and um, engineers and very top people. Chinese Academy of Sciences, Chinese Academy of Engineering are the two highest levels of China. Each has about 800 members. And these are heads of institutes, but they have enormous prestige and enormous power in that sense. So that's in a sense, the, the new China. And so independent voices can begin to uh, uh, impact officials in all these categories. Now it doesn't apply to, to some uh, red line areas uh, dealing with, you know, that you're not gonna see contrary opinions on Taiwan or Tibet or Hong Kong, because uh, those are political issues. But on all the thousands of issues having to do with running the internal system of China, uh, China is becoming a, uh, a, in a sense, more of a participation. I don't want to say more of a democracy because that's a bad word, confusing word to use. But in terms of, of people participating in the process of real reality of how things work, uh, China is doing some really important pioneering work uh, in bringing the best expertise. Now, in, in, in the US, for example, there are a lot of people in expertise and think tanks who throw out ideas, but they're, they're, they're not forced, officials are not forced to take those seriously or to focus on them because of the nature of the system. In China, they, they have to. And so the, the capacity of experts in all aspects of society to impact decision-making of officials is, is stronger in China. And in today's world, that's really super important. So um, China is pioneering. They're also pioneering uh, public surveys of, of the masses as well as the experts and to get feedback from that. And they have systems where when uh, new uh, officials are being appointed, they put out a period of time where anybody can, can criticize them even anonymously if they know of some corruption or something else. So th th there's more public transparency. Now it doesn't apply to the most senior leaders, but it applies to 99.99% of the population in terms of how the system is run. Uh, so we really see in terms of the pioneering structure of, the, of, of China socially, um, we see new innovations uh, for the modern world. And because of big data and the collection in China, whether it's in healthcare or consumer buying or, or anything, we really see pioneering efforts. But here, here's the issue. And you know, we have to say the other side as well, because you have control of information and because you have a, uh, a media that is not totally free, obviously, um, you, you have a constraint on this system. And people then are concerned about not knowing where the line is about what they can say and what they can't say. Uh, the example I gave you of a doctor who, who's saving people's lives, uh, that, that's an extreme case. Most people are not in that condition. So the, there may be a tendency to withhold critical information, which could be important. So um, uh, China is pioneering absolutely frontier ways of thinking, but they also have a challenge in the future regarding control of information and how that will work. And that's a, that's a play whose uh, final act we've not seen yet. Robert, hundreds of people are following us through YouTube and also here through Zoom. I would like to thank everyone who are watching us. And now we're going to have the question of Karim Costa Vasquez. I will remind everyone to keep on time because after Karim, we also have two other questions from Olivia and Luis Duarte. Karim. She is from the scholar of the University Funden of China. She also works uh, 
as assistant professor of OPD, a global university of India. She's a global leader of FinTech Center for China in Globalization and a senior advisor for the UN, where she's the leader of the strategy 2025 of the UN Office for the Cooperation of South South. She wrote several academy and policy papers for cooperation and finance development and international economy folks focused on BRICS and development banks. She had uh, positions of uh, consultancy and uh, strategy for the UN and uh, working for the World Bank, the Islam Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. In the government, she managed the British Fund for the transition of Brazil to a high growth economy and low carbon emission. And she represented the International Affair Ministry in the intergovernmental processes. She writes very often to some of the main uh, newspapers of the world as Financial Times, Al Jazeera, Morning Post, Folha de São Paulo, among others. Karin, it, the floor is yours. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for inviting me so I could be here with Robert in this first class team of specialists and good friends. Experts in China and who also represent the differences of the the diversity schools and also with Brazil. We were talking about this before the meeting, including. Dr. Kuhn, many people who are watching us today are young Brazilians who are starting to understand China and my point of view it's it's something basic to think about these youngsters and when I and also based on my experience to ask my question it's just two days I since I came back to incredible tra trip to Sinchuan province that was organized by CWA of China to promote the interchange of young leaders on global issues and also development issues here in China. And this experience showed me even more how important it is for us to think and to train a new generation of professionals who are not only able to understand the debate on China, but also to translate this China to our reality in Brazil. And when we talk about affairs in, with China and Brazil nowadays, we usually talk about different times, two different times, as far as I see. The first one, the operational time where this bilateral relationship in different aspects, economics and uh, po politics, they operate in the short term. And the second time that, as far as I see, is the strategical time when these different dimensions translates the objectives, the long-term objectives for each country and they converge to what to those objectives that are uh, the same for both. And when they do that, they translate into a transformational potential 
for both countries. For instance, Brazil today is celebrating records of exportation of uh, agricultural commodities and uh, oil that uh, was what assured our positive uh, results in the trade balance, avoiding a collapse of our economy that could be even worse during the pandemic. But we also know that part of this commo commodities boom was fostered by the trade war between China and the US and that in the long term this is not something sustainable. And not only that, along our story we have heard, often heard, that this model created dependence and uh, this kept us in the trap of the average income, a contradiction that up to this day this discussion on how to use our relationship with China to solve some of our structural bottlenecks are still so uh, premature in Brazil. The same way China had uh, dealt with this matters in the past, we also need to face these issues. Another thing is on how to take advantage of these opportunities that uh, the future China, not only the past China, but the future China has to offer us. As you know, in the end, uh, at the end of last year, Xi Jinping committed to to have zero emissions of uh, carbon dioxide up to 2060. But up to this moment, the public debate, not only in Brazil and in the world, especially in the world, because this debate is not uh, being held in Brazil, it's just mainly denying China uh, the capacity of implementing this commitment, of delivering it. But the question no one has have asked is, if in case China reached this goal, what would happen with the global flows of investment above all in the energy sector? And these are questions that we should not be waiting any longer to answer as the countries that want to create this, want to take advantage of these opportunities to create investments and they have to be prepared as soon as possible. And also a demand of China for fossil fuels as this will decrease, this will generate uh, this will affect markets a lot all over the world, including for Brazil, that may serve the wave of the opportunities that will be generated by this transition of the of Chinese economy, as well as suffer the potential risks of this transition. Again, this is a debate that hasn't started in Brazil up yet. So, Dr. Kuhn, my question is yourself being a person who uh, along your career all, always had this role of being a bridge between China and the world. As far as you see, how can we educate a new generation that think of China in a strategic in a strategic way how can we build a public debate 
from based on our long-term interests this is my first question if we have time for more two quick questions which the answers may not be so quick but i will ask them anyway coming back to our bread and butter and the relationship between between the us and china dr kun do you think the us are going to be able to exclude china of the redesign of global chain and what implications this may have on global and chinese economy and the third question is china in the world in this world that is being much more competitive this competition is increasing between the us and china what is the role of uh, political groups as BRICS? to what extent these groups may benefit china thank you very much so those are uh, three uh, very big questions <clears throat> so let me try to address each one uh, <clears throat> in terms of brazil china um, I think the good news is that more and more Chinese officials are sensitive to, um, to the bilateral relations, economic relations with various countries. Um, and so in the past, that was not the case. It was strictly a, um, getting the best resource deal they can, getting the most control that they can, and <clears throat> didn't care about anything else. Uh, that, that was sort of a, a, a kind of a low level way of, I mean, a good way of doing business for themselves. But high level Chinese officials are recognizing that that's not sustainable in, in the world because of the way the world is. Um, and so Chinese officials are more sensitive to developing uh, uh, bilateral relationships with major, especially with major countries. And Brazil is, you know, right there in near at the top of the list in terms of China's uh, um, desire for the future that I know internally in China. So I think there's great opportunity for Brazil uh, to build with China, but it does require, as you said, an internal debate or internal sophisticated thinking in Brazil about how to leverage and build the Chinese relationship that is important from Brazil's point of view. What are the kinds of things that can be done that can help build the Brazilian economy uh, that China may not be aware of and then structure kinds of relationships that can achieve that. Um, you know, if there are industries in Brazil that it wants to, to help develop, maybe in you know, high tech and AI, for example, or aerospace or s some of the areas that, um, that uh, are the ways of the future, um, that if Brazilian companies can go to China with a, a specific plan uh, th that says that, you know, here's the kind of investment that we want. It's not just in, in commodities and oil. We want it in this area as well. And uh, or another one may say that here's a business that we can bring to China at the same time. Maybe you can invest in a minority and then we would set up a, a division in China. So there really will be an integration at high level industries of the future. I, I you know, not, not being an expert on Brazil, of course, but I would say that if I were in your position seeking to, to, to optimize, my favorite word, optimize the Brazil-China relationships on a long-term basis, I would start thinking about what are the kinds of businesses and economic partnerships that we can develop that will build ourselves that, that may not be the most economic from China's point of view right away, may not be, but as part of the overall package, we'll go to senior leaders or appropriate leaders and say, we want, you know, you want to continue buying commodities. We want to sell you commodities, all of that. But at the same time, we want to build these other relationships, which ultimately will be in your best interest, even though the short term economic return may not be as strong. So you may not have, you may not choose to do this 
if we're only by itself, but if you look at in the bigger picture and long term, it'll be beneficial. So I'm not saying it's easy, but if I were in Brazil's position or advising uh, uh, Brazil, I would look for key companies uh, that can develop these kinds of uh, new industries of the future, both in Brazil and doing business in China and put that on the table with high officials and say, look, if we want to continue building this business, uh, building this long-term relationship between the countries, especially because of the long-term expectation of US sanctions or difficulties, if China wants to build with Brazil, which I know it does, you know, you, 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 we have to think about this in a bigger term. And here are the projects that we want to develop that will be built in Brazil, but also doing business in China. Uh, I, I think that would actually, in today's world, meet with a very receptive understanding in China. It's not easy to do when you get down to the details, but I think a long-term plan uh, for leading Brazilian companies to work with China in the developing of new industries, developing of industries that can be that can take advantage of the of the Chinese market, not just in commodities and what we call extraction kind of biz industries, not just extraction, but uh, you know knowledge-based industries. I, I think Chinese officials at higher levels will absolutely support that, especially in today's world. In fact, I think there's a huge opportunity for Brazil uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, to do that. Um, you know, and, and you know, that's, that's an area personally that I like to work in. Um, that's what I've done with major, mainly European companies working in, in China, each one with their own complexities. Um, many of the companies I work with are, are world-class in their own technologies right now. But it's, 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 it's understanding that same political structure. Uh, so, you know, my advice is, and it's a, and it's a strong sense, uh, that Brazil has a huge opportunity in, 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 uh, to work with China. But uh, I think you, you need to think more strategically, not just taking advantage of a U.S. sanction so that you can sell more commodities for the short term. That's, that's fine you know, from your point of view to do, and China would like it. But if you just do that, I think you've squandered an opportunity. Uh, and, and China's not going to present it to you because it's not directly in their short-term interest. But if you present it to China, I think they will see it. It's, it's in China's long-term interest. So, you know, I would have a particular interest in trying to figure out how to, how to make that happen. Um, working with, you know, the, the right people. So, so th this to me is a very important question. And it is a question, it, it is a, it is something that I think Brazil should act on swiftly, because w w there's a unique time period now because of the US problems. Uh, uh, but if you don't, if you just look at it short term to sell, sell products short term, you're going to squander the opportunity. The idea is to do it to build long term, long term industries of the future that can be in both in Brazil and, and Brazilian companies doing business in China. So that's the first part, question. That's the most important one. The, the next two I'll answer quickly. In terms of US-China relations, uh, you know, I really think sadly we passed a tipping point uh, so that it, it cannot, uh, cannot return to the status quo ante with the way it was before uh, for a long period of time. There's an enormous consensus in, in, in the country, uh, not just in Washington, but in the country uh, that's probably 85% or more of, uh, of the country is, is anti-China in the U.S. Um, and so, uh, I, 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 as, I, as I said earlier, the, the best I can hope for is don't do any more harm. And so if we keep it at this level, this bad level, I would be satisfied and then let time do its ultimate cures. A third question in terms of multilateral organization, BRICS in particular, uh, China is, is a great um, supporter of multilateral organizations, as, as you know, and, and, and a major motivation for that, of course, is to disrupt the, what they would call the U.S. Uh, uh, hegemony over, over all institutions. So the more institutions that develop uh, multinational, uh, the, the, the better it is from China's point of view. And so China is a great supporter of, of BRICS for that reason. Um, I'd say China is the, um, of the BRICS countries, the largest supporter of BRICS. It's more important to China than it is to the other countries, each of the other countries. Obviously we know India and China's had severe disruption um, in the last year, 
Um, and, and so uh, I, I think the reality is, A, China wants to encourage multilateral organizations more than any other country. They're, they're a supporter of it. On the other hand, I think the reality is that bilateral relations will be the main driver. And it'll be, you know, Russia, China, and Brazil, China. Um, you know, that's the, just the reality of the world. So, you know, to really make things happen, uh, you know, I would look for very specific bilateral activities like we just discussed with your first question uh, between Brazil and China. I think it's a good time now and a unique time to take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Next question will be asked by Lisa Duarte, that is a global fellow of the Institution Wilson Center. In the last six years, she has been in Hong Kong as a correspondent for, for Global News for Asia. She worked as a correspondent of CNN Brazil in the US, and she's a doctor in po science uh, Political Science from Sorbonne University of France. The floor is yours, Lisa. Hello, hello everyone. I would like to thank for the invitation of being part of this conference. Also, would like to thank, thank you very much those who are watching us and uh, being able to is to participate on a panel with such notorious colleagues it's so important to talk about uh, the complexity on different views of uh, china i would try to be as brief as possible i'll try to comprise different questions into only two the first question is I would like to to ask you, because you wrote the biography of the former president of China, Yong Ling, and once he said during an interview for uh, the American TV that China was misunderstood and that he wanted people abroad to have a more realistic impression on the country. The years passed by and probably this is a shared perception of the Chinese leadership nowadays. I would like to ask you if you agree with that and if yes, where China failed to be understood, to make themselves understood. If China is aimed to be misunderstood for the next couple of years as well, my idea here is to is to tell the Chinese story well. How can we tell Chinese story and how can we translate the Chinese story? There is a recent uh, statement of Xi Jinping in the last week where he says that China needs to make friends and be appreciated by most of the countries. I would like then you if you can address what it is, what does it mean to tell the Chinese story well? And also, how can this be made with no foreigner journalists working at, in China or like if, with this number decreasing even more since in 2020 we saw a record of correspondents who lost their authorization or their visa were were their visa weren't renewed we had 17 in the first semester of 2020 and 
we increasingly see stories of China told by China itself, but foreigners may tell these stories of China, and if that's the case, how? I would like to hear your opinion on how the way China communicates to the with the world have has changed under the leadership of Xi Jinping. A second question I have is related to Hong Kong. Jiang Zemin was the president of China when Hong Kong got back to the Chinese domain in 1997. Hong Kong had uh, a, an outbreak of protest, protests during 2019-2020 that generated stories that are con contradictory in the Western press and also the Chinese media. I would like you to tell us what is the your view on the situation of the of Hong Kong and what is the future of this territory until 2047 thank you very much thank you for the questions uh, two uh, big questions uh, First one is, 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 a, is a bigger one. Let me save that and, and, and go to the second one on, on Hong Kong. I followed that situation very closely. And uh, during, the, uh, during the protests, I said that uh, China would do the absolute minimum that it, 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 it could intervention-wise uh, with uh, several red lines that it wouldn't allow to, to happen. Uh, the, the first was, um, for uh, Hong Kong to, uh, in any sense, seek independence. Um, the second was uh, for, there were three. The first was Hong Kong seeking independence of any kind or close to independence. Second was Hong Kong being used as a base to undermine the political system of the mainland. And the third was disruption so bad that it interrupted the economic development of China. So those were the three red lines that China had and would not intervene in any sense unless they were being uh, severely violated. And it was uh, determined that they were. Uh, and so the, the attitude of China was, it doesn't matter what the world thinks, that the, in this critical time in China, uh, as, I, as I said in, in my opening, uh, you know, moving towards the 20th, um, a CPC National Congress and the the capacity of China to deliver on its uh, on its uh, two big uh, uh, ob objectives the, the the ability of the party to to uh, to improve the standards of living which is clear but also China's status in the world Hong Kong was was a radical exception um, and and could be very disruptive to that. So it was determined that um, there could brook no more uh, protests that would violate those three areas. So the national security law was put in place, which basically um, uh, makes and, and moving towards Hong Kong being very similar to mainland China in terms of, in terms of protests. Uh, the sensitive area will be in information um, because clearly public protests are now excluded in any sense. Um, so the access to information, will there be censorship of the internet? Um, my sense and my hope is that that will not occur. Uh, Hong Kong is, and, and the future of Hong Kong now is totally related uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to the mainland in a very different way. But this was inevitable anyway, with the rise of Shanghai and Shenzhen, Hong Kong was really being marginalized anyway. It was no longer needed to be the, the, uh, the gateway to China. Um, and so that was, uh, that was being lost anyway. So Ch Hong Kong would need to figure out a new economic model. And the only model it has is to be integrated into what I had 
discussed earlier, the Hong Kong, the uh, Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. And this is really a very big opportunity because the uh, GDP of uh, of that of the of the areas I think one and a half or getting more to close to two trillion dollars, uh, maybe one and a half now. Uh, so it, the Greater Bay Area would be in the top fifteen countries in the world <laughs> if that area. So Hong Kong has a big opportunity to to really facilitate that. It's a smaller role than it had in the past, uh, but it it. it it's the only role, so they have to accept that because you know Shanghai and Shenzhen and other places of China have now taken over what Hong Kong used to do uh, as as the totality. Uh, to the first question, which is China's communications to the world, obviously I have been in this mix uh, for uh, you know more than twenty years uh, in a very formal way, um, thirty years broadly, but very specifically for 2022, 22, 23 years. In terms of production, so I'm very, uh, very sensitive. I, I, I've said this in the international media, and, and this is a, this is an exaggeration. So don't take it too literally to make a point. I've said that everything the West says, the Western media says about China is true. Now that's not what I just said is not true, but because uh, a lot, of, uh, some of what's said is deliberately is 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 false. But assume it's all true. Assume it's all true what the Western media says about China. My point is, it is true, but it's not the whole truth. And so to a Western viewer watching Western media, you would think that what they see is close to 100% of the total truth, maybe 95% or something. And in truth, it is nowhere near that. It is, I don't know, there's no right number. I can pick 20%, 30%, 15%. It's, it, 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 they are true problems that China has uh, and, 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 and real issues. You may have differences of opinion on some, but there are real problems in China. But what is not said is all the other things that is going on in China, but we, whether it's poverty alleviation, whether it's uh, the reform of the court system, whether it's the anti-corruption campaign, the anti-pollution, there's a huge amount, whether the training of, of uh, officials. So th the way China works is really, um, really re remarkable. Um, now, China needs to understand some basic facts. I, I just had uh, on one of the media things that I'm involved in, people in China send me things to edit or to give their advice. So there was one little piece that was put out publicity wise that was very good. And it showed the, uh, how China is developing new technologies, innovation, et cetera. Um, and at the end of that, and, and it was all accurate and all good. I didn't correct anything. It was very good. The end of it, it said, you know, this is how China helps the world because the world can all benefit from China's innovation and new technologies, 5G, et cetera. So, and I said, you have to take that sentence out. Be, be, and they said, well, that's what we want to show that we're helping the world. I said, but when you say that, you turn off everybody because everybody knows that's pure propaganda and that that's why you're saying it. The idea is you take that out, you just tell them what you're doing. In fact, you should say, we're bu building uh, a 5G for our own benefit. Now people believe you because they, they think you're doing it. For, they don't think you're doing it for the world's benefit. That, that, that's, nobody does that. You do it for your own benefit. You hope it helps others. Maybe people like you. I said, explain what you're doing. Say you're benefiting yourself and then let other people say, well, maybe that'll help me too. For example, on the, the Belt and Road Initiative, I took the initiative of trying to help China. And I wrote an article, which actually was published by People's Daily, uh, which was quite remarkable, in which I described the eight reasons where the Belt and Road Initiative benefits China. And I, I described all the ways the Belt and Road benefits China. When the Belt and Road first came out, uh, somebody told me when I was gonna do a piece in China about, about it, that I cannot mention that China gets oil from Belt and Road countries. <laughs> I said, if I can't mention that, I'm not gonna do it because that's absurd. Uh, of course, China gets oil and China benefits. And so that led me to, to, to write. So, so it's a way of thinking in China, which is, which is um, you know, somewhat naive. 
in terms of how to uh, uh, explain things. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the simplest way is to tell the truth. Um, and uh, the truth is that China benefits greatly from the Belt and Road, politically, economically, in all these different ways. Um, and, and when you say that, people then believe you and uh, let them come to their own conclusion. So China has, has to learn, they're trying to. Um, there is a lot of different currents going on. You have the, an extreme nationalistic current that is developing in China, which is very detrimental. Uh, even some very distinguished nationalists, if they're not always supporting everything that China does, then they can be severely criticized. So it's, it's a problem in, in China too. Um, and certainly journalists and, uh, you know, Ch China has, uh, it doesn't want to be in a position where it's being criticized all the time. It has to have its own criticism, which makes it the situation almost e even worse, uh, whether it's, uh, accusing the U.S. of starting uh, the COVID uh, pandemic or the wolf warriors. None of that is beneficial uh, for China, but it does, it does feed the, um, the nationalistic sense of, uh, of uh, not being taken advantage of. So there are, re there are real historic reasons why China and the people feel that way. But as China grows, they have to grow out of that and to show a uh, less sensitivity. Uh, to e every slight that people may say uh, um, um, uh, real or, or imagined. I'll give you one example. Um, a couple of years ago, I don't know if you, you, you remember this, but uh, Cambridge University Press, oldest university press in the world, um, I think they do about $100 million worth of business in China. So it's, it's, it's a good sized business for them. Um, and somebody in China decided that an obscure publication of the of, of Cambridge University Press uh, having to do with China had articles in it online about Tiananmen Square or Falun Gong or whatever that they didn't like. So they asked them to take take those articles down. And Cambridge University with $100 million and nobody read those art, nobody read those articles anyway. So it didn't matter. They took them down. Well, as you can imagine, that led to a firestorm uh, in the UK and around the world that China was imposing its ideological sense beyond its own borders. In their mind, it's bad enough you do it in the border, now you're imposing it beyond the borders. So that was a, a real ham-handed approach. And, 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 and prior to, to that, nobody knew about these articles. After that, the whole world knew about these articles. So it had exactly the reverse. So China has to be more, grow to be more confident in its achievements, whether it's poverty alleviation or electric vehicles and new technology, space, you know, a, rover, a, a, a lander on Mars, great accomplishments in many areas. China has to grow to be more uh, confident and not allow every person, every slight or every uncertainty that they have to control. Uh, and that's a maturing process. And I think Xi Jinping's latest um, pronouncements, which were very significant, um, you know, sends that message that there has to be a kind of a different way of, of thinking about China to tell the, a true story about China. Thank you very much, Robert. Next question will be asked by Olivia Bula. She's a journalist, a specialist in economy and financial market, a master in communication from the University of Sao Paulo, and she's a journalist of Valor Econômico. Olivia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert. Next question will be asked by Olivia Bula. She's a journalist, a specialist in economy and financial market, a master in communication from the University of Sao Paulo, and she's a journalist of Valor Econômico. Olivia, the floor is yours. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. We have different time zones here and it's a great honor to be here side by side of such great names and uh, as Evander mentioned, people who I always follow their work and I have the challenge of being the last one to ask. Most of my questions have already been answered, which is something that I, I feel luck, 
lucky enough, but also made me feel very challenged on which question to ask. So, I will talk about financial market, which is something, an investment, which is something I do well, and it's been something that is growing, like the Wall Street looking at the economic growth of China. We see investment banks with partnerships and guiding businesses in the area of the Big Bay. This shows uh, interest of the Western of the West in relation to the Chinese market. We also see some criticism of uh, Chinese authorities in relation to this growth of um, on the price of commodities and also cryptocurrencies. As they are saying, these are speculation and uh, the Chinese authorities are working on the regulation, which is something they do not see very well. And they, Actually, the financial market don't see very well. Based on your experience and how you transit in the different businesses, both from the Chinese point of view and also the rest of the world view, I will then ask you, um, what do you think is still necessary to be done in reforms related to financial open in China and maybe to reduce this view that the West has uh, in relation to a heavy intervention of the state and as a counterpart how it will be the role of the state with uh, uh, the entrance of foreign companies into the consumption market, how would the state work in this sense? And also talking a bit about, do you think like the China is criticizing the cryptocurrency, but they are also launching the U digital U1 that is something that a lot of central banks want to, to make it as well. To, so from this financial reforms that China is trying to make, wouldn't they be like creating a trend as we see a lot of this uh, this uh, liquidity that is happening and that some banks are creating and uh, maybe China is somehow opening the eyes of the Western world on the regulation model as it was discussed recently in G7 if you would have uh, of having a global fee on techno technology companies. But my main question is related to investments. How? And if you may comment on the investment opportunities, long-term opportunities for China, as you mentioned for Kyrene, that Brazil must think in the long-term view, I would like you to list the m main things that investors and companies should be looking at so to foster the growth, both for financial market and the economy, not only Chinese economy, but, but global economy, actually. Thank you. Very uh, important questions, uh, broadly economic and, and financial in terms of, uh, of China. Let me just make uh, some, uh, some isolated comments on, on, on your very well-structured uh, big overview. Uh, first of all, inflation is, uh, is, is probably the most sensitive issue in China. 
um, because other problems can uh, can filter out and 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 take months or years to affect people. Inflation will f affect them the next day. Their price of pork or milk goes up, and people get upset. So China is very sensitive to inflation, and 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 the and the jump in inflation in China um, has been um, uh, has been blamed in a sense on the. Uh, the, the, the printing of money by Western countries seeking to overcome the problems of the, uh, uh, of the pandemic, particularly in the US, the biggest spending ever. Uh, I, I think it's inevitable when you have that type of, of global spending having to bring back, uh, a, a bring back the economy that you're going to have inflation. I mean, that's just part of the cost of, of doing business. China, though, is very sensitive to, to this, and they will be watching that very closely and will deal with it if, if it becomes more out of control, it, they'll deal with it brutally uh, in, in order to control that uh, because that is the single most important thing because that could lead to social disruption. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I would comment that it is really important in China as they see the situation to engage more with foreign companies in China. This is, this is difficult because they really do want it. And yet, there are obstacles to it of, of various uh, of various kinds. Uh, but I, I do think that China wants to show, I, I know, it's not I think, I know China wants to show the world that the Chinese market is open. This is a great attraction that China has. It's also leverage that they have, as we see with Australia. But um, they want to show the world that China is open for business. They want to engage with the world. They don't want to be looked upon as rapacious and uh, mercantilistic towards other countries. They want to show that the Chinese market is open. Uh, they do want to show that. And so I think there is great opportunity for certain kinds of companies to come to China. It's not, it's not the way it was maybe 20 years ago where any foreign company could be competitive in China. There are many strong Chinese companies. Uh, but uh, China wants to show the world that the that China is open in order to satisfy its its geopolitical interests. But also, this is, you know the, the officials are very smart, and they recognize that it's important for the Chinese market to have strong foreign companies in various industrial sectors because that makes the Chinese companies more competitive and and benefits the Chinese consumer. Uh, so they recognize that it is important to engage with very good Western uh, foreign companies for, from wherever. Uh, so I, I think we, we have an opportunity here where the media in the world is, shows China as, a, as mercantilistic and a closed market, which of course there are reasons for that in terms of uh, China has been closed in many areas, but China really wants to open those markets because it, it, it has these broader objectives and uh, both image and, and real substance. So the, the timing is very good. Now as to how to do that best, it's, it's, it's complicated and it has to be on a micro scale to really analyze and to do the proper thing. And it's not easy and it, it doesn't, it's not done in, in a short time. But the, uh, the macro environment in China for relations, uh, economic relations <clears throat> with good, strong investor groups or companies from, from other countries is, 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 is very good at this time. And so I, I think uh, that should be taken advantage of. You know, you will always have the problems of, uh, of, of potential disruption of, because of bilateral relations. Uh, frankly, I think Brazil is in a better uh, uh, kind of strategic position than other countries because it doesn't have the same kind of relations that an Australia would or, or Japan or, or uh, certainly the U.S., uh, so I think there'd be less risk. There's always some risk to Brazilian companies trying to, uh, you know, take advantage of what China wants to be a real openness. Uh, so I, I, I think the, op the, the, the opportunity is, is, is there, but one must, uh, one must approach China, as I said, differently than you would uh, any other market. Thank you, Robert. As we are out of time, and I believe that the questions we received in our Q&A 
chat of uh, the people who are watching. I believe they were all answered. So Robert, I just wanted to hear your final words so we can close our event. Uh, uh, can, can you <clears throat> tell me some of the questions? Of course. How the dynamic between Shenzhen and Hong Kong works? In which points the city works as a kind of cluster in a more homogeneous way? And in which parts they are uh, counter and contrary in economics and politics? Another question. To what extent the initiative Belter Road will be able to realize the transference of technology and know-how of their partners? And just one last question and then you can answer these three questions. I would like to know how Robert understand in the scope of the control of the Chinese party on the multinational companies, the diplomatic relationship relationship between China and Brazil. Well, this um, relationship should be analyzed uh, thinking, taking into account the ideological bias of China. Okay, so three very different questions. Relationship between Hong Kong and Shenzhen is an evolving one. Uh, China has said subtly that uh, if Hong Kong wants to go its own way in the world, uh, Shenzhen is there ready to replace it, um, which is not what they want to do. They want uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen to be a real partnership um, in, in, the, in the world, basically within this Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, which Shenzhen is a critical part of. Um, and so what it's moving towards is a, an amalgam uh, of this coordinated development between the two, with Hong Kong hopefully remaining um, a, a, a beacon with, it, with uh, the judiciary and access to information in the international community, level of, of quality in Hong Kong as a, as a, um, a driver it would be very, very uh, positive for the development of the of this the whole greater bay area so it's moving in that direction uh i think with the national security law there'll be a period of adjustment um and hong kong will not have the position it had in the past certainly but as part of this new greater bay area it can make a great contribution and make the greater bay area an, a, a very important world center of economic development scientific development etc so um th i i think from that point of view there is uh, there is optimism uh, for the future, but the future will not be the way it was in the uh, past. Um, with respect to the, the Belt and Road and technology transfer, I think that's a, um, a, a very important aspect that China is becoming more sensitive to, that they do want, they do want to, uh, they do not want to be seen as a neo-colonialist. That was never their intent. It, it, just, it just had the appearance of that because of the natural development of, uh, of, of economics. So China, needs to reach out with, um, with technology transfer and with, with um, industrial transfer as well so that the other countries can truly be partners. And this is in China's long-term interest, may not be in the short-term interest, but it is in the long-term interest because what it will do is then create in other countries uh, strong economic um, entities that China will trade with. And so as China's relationship with the the U.S. And, and Western Europe countries maybe is uh, is um, is uh, constrained due to political tensions. Um, the more other countries develop, the better it will be for China. So I, I think enlightened people in China recognize this, and I, that's why I think there are opportunities, as we talked about, for Brazil in terms of technology to develop with China. Uh, that uh, China, key people in China will see as a long-term advantage for China and will support that 
which will be very good for Brazil, China economic uh, development. Uh, the third question, I was a little unsure what the thrust was in terms of the communications uh, between the communist uh, party or the leadership of China and, and the West or the world because of uh, ideological differences. Maybe you can clarify the, question, the third question a little bit. So are we talking about the requirement in China that branches of the Communist Party will be now in, in all companies, including foreign companies? Uh, that's a very particular question. I'm not sure that's the thrust of the question. Um, I mean, the thrust of the question is I'm not bothered um, by the ideology of China as it reflects business in China. I've, I've not been bothered. That's not never been an issue. In fact, in a strange way, I looked upon that as an asset because companies that can understand how that works not only shouldn't be frightened by it, but can actually leverage it for their own good. Uh, you have to really understand how the politics works in China and how the system works, but um, uh, you, you can really use that system as a foreign company working in China in a, in a beneficial way, not just to help, help, help the business uh, on its own, but also in a competitive sense against others. If you, if you take that relationship and, and really uh, develop it uh, cleverly, you, you can actually, it'll, it'll actually be beneficial uh, to, to you. So maybe, again, I'm still not sure exactly the question, but I can answer it on a micro level and a macro level. Micro level, I just answered it where individual companies have party branches in them which is now being enforced more so. And I believe you can leverage that for your own benefit. It's not something you may have chosen to do out of the blue, uh, but given that, given that reality, you can actually leverage it for the benefit of, of the company. On a macro basis, in terms of broad relationships, economic be between Brazil and China, uh, I, I see ideology have no, no impact at all. Um, the impact is, uh, kind of structural economics and being sure that in the process, uh, Brazil is not, you know, trading the long-term for the long-term loss for short-term benefit and to take advantage of, of Chinese recognition that uh, it's important for China's long-term future that Brazil be an equal partner and not resent after a number of years because of the unequal trades and commodities versus technology and manufacture. And so that's, that, that I think is the key issue. It's nothing to do with ideology. It's nothing to do with ideology. It, it has to do with this, this uh, a, a, a sophisticated sense of the, the economic dynamics as it would play out over time. And I think uh, that can be utilized for Brazil and, in, and, and for China's long-term interests. Perfeito, Robert, muito obrigada. É, cinco minutos de considerações finais para a gente finalizar, pode ser? <laughs> sure. Uh, you want me to make some final comments? Is that, uh, uh, you know, I think we've covered uh, a lot of great material. Um, I believe and have believed that uh, relations between Brazil and China are very important for the world um, and for obviously for both uh, countries as well. Uh, many people in China think that way, uh, uh, but I would again emphasize what I've said is that uh, because of that and because of uh, you know, US sanctions, uh, there's a unique opportunity for Brazil and, and it should think, uh, um, think hard about how to, how to take long, make long-term benefit out of it. Um, because I think China would be receptive, but they're not going to do it on their own. So Brazil needs to be proactive in thinking through what, what is the economic dynamic between Brazil and China, you know, 20 years from now, or looking at China's uh, uh, target date, 2050. You know, in 2050, what is the ideal relationship economically between Brazil and China? And then to to start now planning for, for that event. And I think, I think if you thought of it that way, you would have a different conclusion than, than the, you, you would have a different strategy than the one being operated right now. It's easy to sell commodities. 
and you know you need it for the economy and various other things. Uh, but to have a different approach and to and to support the first rate Brazilian companies, even smaller ones that could do business in China, could develop uh, joint ventures, uh, develop technology in both places. Um, again, that's hard work, but it is really worth it. And, and you have a window to do it now in order to plan the relationship in the future. And as I said, long term, that's in China's interest as well as in Brazil's. Excellent, Robert. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, for being with us up to now. I would like to thank Karin, Luisa, Elias, Evandro, Olivia, all of you who have been watching us up to now. Surely this was a talk that is a milestone and that will carry on, Robert. Thank you once again. It was a great honor to have you here. For all of you who are watching us, register. Next Monday, we'll start the panels of our Congress. And there will be an opening panel where we will receive uh, Elias de Quilo, Isabella Weber, Maria Estaiano, Luiz Gonzaga Beluso, to talk about contemporary China and the mediation between state, economy and market. You are all invited. You just have to access our website so you can register to the panel and we wait for you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a real, it's real pleasure. Mm -hmm. Could you send me some of the comments? Because uh, when we we're out, I won't have access to that. If, if you could send a file of all the comments people made, that would help me learn and uh, we can, we can uh, progress from there. Claro, mandarei. Lu, a gente já fechou a, a transmissão?